Our brother Robert's text tonight comes from Genesis chapter 19, verse 19. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Good news, brethren. We've been given mercy. And we know this because we can see it, because God has magnified his mercy. To magnify something is to take it and make it big and obvious so that you can see it clearly. If you take a sample of blood and you put it under a magnifying glass, you can see what makes blood blood. For example, the platelets, the white blood cells, and so on. But it doesn't end there. The reason you put it under a microscope to analyze it is to see how it affects the body. For example, you count those white blood cells to see if there's infection in the body, and you make sure that the hemoglobin is carrying the oxygen that your body needs, and so on. God has done this with mercy. He has magnified the mercy, made it big. He's given it to us. We've experienced it, and he's made it obvious. He's made it big so that we can analyze it, he's, so we can see what makes mercy mercy and how it fits into the whole, which is salvation. Now, there are many examples of mercy being magnified that we can analyze. One of the first, which is our text, being Genesis 19.19. This is when Lot, he was going to escape from Sodom. And again, it says, Indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight. You have increased your mercy, which you have shown to me by saving my life. This circumstance that Lot was going through made mercy obvious to him. To him, mercy was life. Another example, Genesis 39, verse 21. This is when Joseph, he was in prison for many years. But it says the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. His circumstance made mercy very obvious to him. To him, mercy was favor. Now, there are many examples and details of people experiencing mercy for what it is. But how it all plays a part in salvation is this. God is bringing many sons to glory. Mercy saved us from the clutches of sin. We were given Christ who died for us and rose so that we might live. To us, this circumstance was made obvious. To us, mercy is life. And we continue to be in need of mercy from God. We are still in this world and we have the flesh that we have to fight daily with. The circumstances we are in make mercy very obvious to us. To us, mercy is favor in God's sight. So as God has magnified mercy, we continue to experience it. We continue to analyze it. We continue to learn about it. And in doing this, we are actually learning about a char characteristic of our own God, for he is the God of mercy. So brethren, may mercy be multiplied unto you. This God that created all things and all things were created for him and by him and through him and to him. And See this? What if you had a God that was so magnificent, that was so filled with splendor, and yet he was unknown? Unless, it, 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 he, he, there was no way to actually reach out and be able to identify be able to understand, be able to benefit from, be able to enter into or fellowship with a God of this greatness because of your own puniness. See, now this is the obstacle that God had to encounter in salvation. He had a man that was fallen far. The fall took man far away from God. Now, if he was ever going to be known, which, you know, I'm speaking as a man now then he would have to bridge the gap between man and himself. He would have to initiate the plan for him to be known. He would have to do that. Of course, we know that before he ever made the world, before he ever made man, this intention was in his, his um, purpose. See, he, he, he purposed that he would make himself known. He would divulge who he was. <laughs> now, we've only seen the hem of the garment. And I don't know, sometimes I think maybe it's not even quite the whole hem yet. But we're just seeing a part. Just a very, but see, it's so compelling. 
you get a taste of the powers of the world. You start thinking about God and, and what He's done and what He's revealed, and it'll change your life. Amen. It will. It'll, it'll do it. Amen. Of course, that's what it's been designed to do. The merciful God. Moses asked God, remember he asked him, show me thy glory. Why would Moses say that? He had become familiar somewhat with God. He had gotten close enough to God that he realized, I don't know enough. I want to know more. I, I've seen, I've seen the, the outline. I want to know him. Paul, remember he said, no, the, the power of his resurrection. He wasn't content for what he just had here. He said to be there is far better. Why? Because he had come close. He had come closer than most men. And his desire wasn't to, his first desire wasn't to stay here, that's for sure. Tonight we're going to focus on a specific aspect of God's mercy. This is part four in, in the series of the merciful God. And this one's called magnified mercy. Now, you know, there's a sense in which we all can identify with this term. God has, to some degree, magnified mercy to everyone that's in Christ. You couldn't be in Christ unless God, to some degree, has magnified His mercy. In other words, look at it like this. He's shown you who you were, and He showed you who Christ was. And what did that do? It magnified His mercy. Oh, I need mercy. So you come and you ask for mercy. See, God's inclined to give mercy to those who love Him. This is what he's inclined to do. Now this text in Genesis 19, 19 says, Behold, thou thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. He, see, he, he, was, he was familiar with God, but he seen something new on this day, didn't he? Oh, yes, he did. Which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Now the most apparent conclusion of anything being magnified is that it really is, it becomes evident what it is. Yeah. Now, yeah. until mercy is really seen for what it really is, see, man will create all kinds of doctrines where he'll attempt to abuse mercy. See, flesh, flesh always looks for an advantage or a way to express itself anywhere it can. Now, you, you all know this, but a misapprehension of mercy creates a lot of flesh. It's a lot of flesh. In a, see, if, if, you, if you get the idea that all I have to do is just, I'll just go to a building somewhere and I'll say a few words to a man who calls himself a priest and then he'll give me an indulgence. What is that? That's a misapprehension of God's mercy. They, they don't know what mercy is or they wouldn't be doing that. Uh -huh. you, technically, you cannot misappropriate salvation. You can't. You can't. And yet, see, okay. men think they can. Men have created all kinds of ways to where they can think they're godly and maintain flesh. Ah, uh, it can't happen. See, when you encounter mercy, when you see it, when mercy is magnified, it makes, it makes what God has offered or what God's done or provided evident. Oh, this is, this is good. Now, the when you magnify something, your perception of it is enlarged. Your perception of, although the actual thing hasn't changed at all. <laughs> it's still the same as it always was, but it's been magnified. To your perception, you've actually been able to comprehend what it is. God's, and there's no question whether or not God is mercy, a merciful. He's a merciful God. It's, it's a part of who He is. He's expressing His mercy, but it isn't like he's, he's getting more merciful. He's merciful. <laughs> you know, like light, you can't reduce light. You can't break it down into some subcomponents. Light is light. And mercy is mercy. It's what it is. And now when he magnifies it through, and he, he does it in such a, a gentle way. We have a very gentle God. He, he's, he, God's not just jerking us up to heaven. He's working with us, see? He's working with us because in order for us to understand what, he, what, what this is, that this part of his nature is, he has to work with you. And, and he said that, that work is well, just very gentle. I, I appreciate his gentleness. He said, thy gentleness has made me great, right? That this is, when you see that God's not out to injure you, really, he's not. He's out to help you to be able to comprehend who he is. Now, these three aspects... 
I wanted to briefly go over tonight is mercy is worth being magnified. There's more than, there than you've seen. Uh -huh. See, God's mercy is larger than our comprehension. Amen. It is. Amen. Now, for, it, once you get involved with mercy and you see you know, the tip of the iceberg, which mercy is kind of like an iceberg, isn't it? You see just a little bit of it, but it's big. Oh, yes, it is. But see, it's worthy of being magnified. So that's the first thing. And then men must possess faith to see or to perceive mercy. You can't really perceive mercy rightly independent from faith. And then God always magnifies his mercy for a reason. God never, God never just doles out mercy just for the sake of doling it out. He doesn't do that. He doesn't. He's not ever merciful accidentally. It's for a reason. Amen. So now, I already mentioned that mercy was like an iceberg. I was kind of was pleased with that, that picture. I could see that in my mind. I could see a, a lot of things going on there. See, it, the bulk of God's mercy lies unseen in the sea of His eternal purpose. See, you don't know a lot of the implications of God's mercy. You know the part where it touches you. See, you've been given to see that. You've been given, He magnified mercy to you when He brought you into the kingdom. You saw that Christ, He's a Christ. He's, he's my Savior. Magna, magnified mercy. But see, it was just your personal element of it. Now see, you can grow. You grow when you start seeing the bigger picture of what His mercy has, has done in, in the body of Christ. We start seeing what He's done collectively. He's got a chaste virgin. And He's going to present it to Himself. What's He done? He's magnified mercy. You know, the heavenly personalities are looking on and they've, oh, they've seen mercy. They've seen it magnified. Look, this group that were in the pit. All of these were in the pit. There's not one of them that was righteous. No, not one. But look at them now. Look at them now, Father. What's he done? He's magnified mercy. Remember, um, Abraham, I wanted to say just a quick note here about, because you weren't talking about Lot tonight. But I want to just briefly, and I, you know, I say, you all know this, all right? Anybody knows the scripture knows this, that God didn't save Lot for Lot. Now, I know that this is, can be confused, but see, God saved Lot because of Abraham. Yeah. This is what he did. Why he do this? Because he's showing us a picture of what mercy is all about. Amen. That's right. A mercy, his mercy is, is magnified or seen in the context of the whole character of God. Why does God show mercy? It's just, just like, I'll show it to you, but I'm going to withhold it from you. For no apparent reason at all. It may look like that from our pers perspective, but from his perspective, he's doing it for a very pre-calculated reason. So, so he's, he says, that's what he says. Remember, uh, the angels, they came to Abraham, and actually they came to talk to Sarah, but they're there, and and he, he says, can I hide from Abraham this thing that I'm going to do? You know, it wasn't reasonable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with He shares it with Abraham. Abraham pleads with him. Why? Because Abraham knows that Lot's there. That's the only reason. Now, we know earlier he went down. There. Remember, they took Lot. The kings took Lot, and they carried him away. And Abraham gets his servants, and he goes down there, and he gets Lot. He gets Lot. That's why he did it, for Lot's sake. And he brought him back. So see, when he hears it, oh, there's going to be a destruction of Sodom. Oh, my brother's there. My brother's there. So he starts pleading with the Lord. And the thing that he says, <laughs> he says, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? He started getting into a little bit of Abraham's character there. What kind of a person Abraham, how does Abraham think about this whole situation? There's a righteous man down there. Lord, I know there's a righteous man down there. You wouldn't slay him with the wicked, would you? You see, you see how he's appealing to the nature of God. He's appealing to the mercy of God. Of course, it worked, didn't it? It worked. You got him down to 10. I can see Abraham thinking there's got to be at least 10 there. His family's there. At least 10 there. Notice that Abraham never one time pleaded for the wicked. Never one time. And neither should we. Amen. See, now, there's a difference between pleading that God will save the wicked and pleading that they'll be changed. There's a difference. See, Abraham 
but he already received the message that he was going down there to see the wickedness. Abraham had firsthand encounter with the wickedness of Sodom. He knew they were wicked, didn't he? He knew from his encounter with them when he went and saved Lot. So, the Lord's, it's, it's, it's just the way the Lord works. He set this whole thing up. He gave us a, the reason why he's going to send these angels in there. Okay, he's going to, he tells Lot, I'm going to, I'm going to send them down to see, to see. Whether it's as bad as, as, it, as the cry that's come unto me, I'm going to see. But when the angels tell it to Lot, that isn't what they tell him. It's we come here to destroy this city. That's what we come here to do. We come here to destroy this, but we can't do it until we get you out. We got to get you out first. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening. Now just briefly, think about this. Now remember Lot, Hebrews, or Peter's going to call him a righteous man, right? Yeah. Righteous, just man. Now he's sitting at the gate of the city, and here comes these men. Now he knows these are not, these are not men of Sodom. These are different men. These are special men. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. Now, these are, these are strangers. This is how Lot treated strangers. Now, <laughs> we've talked about this already, but see, this, this, what, what, did you get the heart of Lot? You don't, know where, you don't know the city you're coming into here. You have no idea what, what you're coming into here. This is, this is a wicked city here. And he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn and I pray into your servant's house and tarry all night, wash your feet. And you shall rise up early and go on your ways. Don't, <laughs> you don't know what you're getting into here. And they say, No, we're going to stay in the street. <laughs> oh, he, oh, can you see Lot? He's, he's there. He's, he, I know what the city's like at night. You don't want to be in the street here, not be a man. They will abide in the street, and he pressed upon them greatly. Now, you see, Later, when the Holy Spirit writes him up, he says he's a just man. This, it, this, the conversation of these wicked people, it vexed him every day. Now, see, this is a perfect candidate for God to display his mercy on. Perfect candidate. See, God chooses. In other words, God chooses who he's going to do this with. All right? And so they turned into him. They listened to him. All right. You've convinced us. We turned in, and he made a feast, and he... I mention all this in order to highlight the means through which God brought Lot into the position where he could perceive God's mercy. See, God had been working with Lot the whole, the whole way. He did put him with Abraham, right? I mean, it was no coincidence that this is Abraham's brethren. He'd been around Abraham a long time. And now here, for circumstances that, that were out of his control, that they couldn't dwell together. They're too much substance. So here he is. He's been separated from Abraham for a while now. He's sitting at the gate, vexed with their filthy conversation. This wasn't a pleasant life. It's like maybe your life. When you're out there in the workplace and you have to deal with all the things that you have to deal with out there. It's not a pleasant thing to go through, but there's grace to do it. Lot did it, didn't he? He maintained his integrity in the middle of living in Sodom. That's pretty great, I think. That's great reward coming there. See, God's mercy must be presented as God has presented it. As soon as man puts his hand to that altar, he's defiled it. As soon as you start talking in your own words about mercy and start explaining it away, it loses what God put into it. The appeal that God's put into mercy is great. He's displayed, he's revealed mercy as it should be revealed. It's not limited. It's an abundant mercy. And yet at the same time, he will by no means impute the guilty. He won't do it. And does that mean he's not merciful? No, it means he is merciful. It's all part of his nature. Until people have been faithful with what the Lord's already shown them, he will not allow his mercy to be properly understood. He, this, this is mercy. It's not something that, that you can just be casual about the Lord and understand mercy. It's not going to happen. He won't, see, he tells you. He tells you don't cast your pearls before the swine, and neither does he. See, the close children, those that come close to him, then he'll reveal these, these secrets to them. He'll not allow his mercy to be, to be um, 
to be taken advantage of. See, men, if they think in their mind that they're getting away with it, well, they're just, they're just deceived. They're not getting away with it. Mercy doesn't cover sins that aren't repented of. Oh, this is a... We're living in evil times. The Apostle Peter adds this information about our brother Lot. It's what he says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example of those that should after live ungodly, and delivered just Lot. That doesn't mean that he just delivered Lot. He delivered this just holy man named Lot. Right. He delivered him. Dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. That's what they did. He hated what they did. And it sounds like he wasn't too silent about it. <laughs> they all knew about what. He, he didn't go along with what we do. The Lord knoweth. Now see, we're going to see the, how this happened. This is what, what Peter said. He said, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. Now what we got this evening is an example, lived out example of God doing just that. See, none of the wicked got out. None of them. They all died that day. When the sun rose up, they died. But you know what? Lot was delivered. He really was. God showed mercy. He magnified his mercy and made it known. Now generations and generations have been talking about this very event. Uh -huh. This magnified mercy that God made it known who he loved. And he made it known who he hated. And people say that, well, you know, they, God didn't really destroy them because they were a bunch of sodomites. They need to grow up. They need to think with their brain. God destroyed them because of what they did. Lot hated it because of what they did. Uh -huh. That's just the truth. Now, the angels had come into the city that night. They'd been sent for a specific work. And this is what they told him. Genesis 19, 22. Hasten the escape hither, for now I cannot do anything till... Till thou become thither. Now, this is after he got him out of the city. But I'm saying he, it was divulged a lot. Although the destruction of the city, Genesis 19, 13, for we will destroy this place. It's what he told them. We're going to destroy this place. In other words, you've got to get out because we're going to destroy this place. Because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. That's why we're here. We're not here to exercise mercy on Sodom. It's over. There's no more mercy towards Sodom. They're not going to live another day. We're here to take it out. Now, Lot, if you don't want to be destroyed with them, you got to get out. You got to get out. Now, I think we can all we can all understand the scenario. We're in the same scenario. Amen. See, we got this body that cleaves to the dust. Now, this body's going to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed. All of the lust that this body attempts to provoke, it's going to be shut down someday. Now, which are you culturing? Are you culturing godly desires? Or are you allowing your flesh to allow you to culture fleshly desires? See, we're all in this boat. This is the same circumstance. But we got to choose. Now, there's mercy with the Lord. I know. We're going to destroy this place. Actually, as I thought about this, the encounter with Lot at the gate was more about the angels meeting up with Lot than it was Lot meeting up with the angels. <laughs> they sought him out. They were there to, to deliver him. And they were there to destroy the city. We can see from the text that Lot, he does do what he can. Lot was very proactive in helping these men. He did what he could do. In his mind, think about it, he, he talked to them, and then he, he persuaded them. He, he pressed on them. So you you got to stay with me. you got to stay with me. You don't want to stay with anybody else in this town. You want to stay with me. Yeah. All right, well, they did, didn't they? Yeah. So he, was, see, he did what he could do. But did, did he know at that time? That he was working out his own salvation with fear and trembling. See, this is, this is the, the, as, a, as the man of God lives his life unto the Lord. See, this is what you're doing. You're making straight paths for your feet. Amen. See, it's all practical. Well, after, of course, <laughs> and also later when the men come. Remember, the men come and they reason with Lot. The angels actually saved Lot from the men. Remember, they, he blind, the angels blinded him, pulled Lot in. 
He, he's, they're delivering him. If the men would have had their way, they'd have killed him that night. And after this long night, Lot's told by the angels to quickly leave this city. Get out. That's just in Genesis 19, 15. And when the morning rose, now remember this is the morning. Follow the timeline. The morning. Because before this day, before the sun's at the noon position, this city's gone. All right, the morning. This was the last morning Sodom ever saw. This was it. The morning rose, the angels hastened. They hastened Lot. No time to be slow now, Lot. Come on. Amen. All right, rise. Take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here. You got them in the house. We got to get them out. Out of the city. Lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. City's going down. You got to get out. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. Yeah. I don't know if you caught that. The Lord being merciful unto him. The Lord wasn't going to let him be destroyed in the city. Now, I've heard a lot of people bash a lot about this. But see, there's a certain sense in which we have to be delivered. The Lord has to step in at some point in time and he has to deliver us. Now, we're, <laughs> we're a part of it. Lot didn't look back, did he? No, he didn't. But see, the, the angels, they, they saw he wasn't going as fast as he needed to go. And they, they got a hold of him. Now, whether or not they supernaturally took him out of the city like Elijah or something, I don't know. It sounds that way to me. It sounds like me. They took hold of him and they were outside the city. Now, if they, if they just let him out of the city, however you look at it, they saved Lot. That's the point. They saved him. So here he is outside the city. They had to do it. They had to do it because he lingered. Now, I don't know about you, but I've, I'm thankful that we have a God like this. Now, see, if God was an austere man, as though some have, have thought him to be, then he would have just destroyed Lot, right? He did linger. He did have a reason. I mean, he could say, well, you lingered. But see, we have, well, this is a merciful God. God's showing his mercy. He's magnifying his mercy. Lot knew he lingered. Lot knew that. And here, here he is outside the city. And he's going to say, he's going to reason on what he's seen. And that's where we get in our verse 19. It says, Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. I, I've made the connection. I've made the God connection now. You, you are delivering me from this, from this destruction. I can see it. And yet, see, when you see something, it's not just enough to, it's not to, to see it. You've got to do something with it. And look what Lot does with what he's seen. He's seen the Lord's been gracious to me. All right. And thou hast magnified thy mercy. I know. I, I know. I, I'm tasting of the very mercy that you're showing me right now. All right. In saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mount, lest some evil take me. So he says, let me go to that city. Right? And he said, I have accepted thee concerning this thing. Remember, yes, he made a request that, that I've heard so many people say that Lot was an evil person because he made this request. Lot saw that God was merciful, saw that he was gracious, saw that he had magnified. And so he made a request, and the Lord honored it because he saw it. Well, it's quite an amazing request if you consider that it was based on what he saw about God. Lot understands at this point that it was God that delivered him from destruction. He saw that if, if the Lord was inclined to be merciful to, unto him, then because he saw that God was a merciful God, he could, he could ask this request of God, of God. And he did. He asked the request. And the angel doesn't say, how dare you ask me about this? That isn't what the angel said, is it? No. The angel said, see, I've accepted thee concerning this thing also. I will not overthrow this little city. I won't do it for your sake. Now, see, there's all kinds of pictures in this account. Amen. What God's doing. God's in charge of this whole thing. 
and his servant, Lot, he's, he's seen somewhat. And by the way, Lot doesn't stay in the city, does he? He doesn't. See, he, he stays there for however how long, and then he gets himself to the mountain. I'm showing that God's merciful. He's a merciful. He worked with Lot. Amen. He brought him to an understanding. And then the next thing you hear about Lot, he's, he, he gets out of that city. See, until men see and properly perceive that mercy is not merely a work, but, but it's an extension of the nature of God. It's showing who he is. It's not just that God's nice to you. Because actually, mercy is much bigger than you, and it's much bigger than being nice. It's God. It's who God is, and he's expressing that. And how he works it out in the lives of men allows them to perceive it. It magnifies it. If all a person can conclude is that God's an austere man, well, we already know what he'll do, right? He'll dig a hole, and he'll bury his talent. That's what he, every single time. You get the wrong impression about God, and you won't do what you're supposed to do. I don't know that a person can. If you've got a, a, a picture of a God that's not what God said he is, well, you don't know God. When Moses asked God to show me thy glory, he wasn't disappointed with what he saw, that's for sure. He didn't say, oh, I thought you'd be greater. No, no, no. <laughs> he worshipped him. Now, these implications about God's mercy being magnified in order that all those who actually have mercy can be approved of God. See, how can you be approved of God and not know Him? How would you perceive, if God was, say God was merciful to you, and yet you didn't have faith, how would you know it? How would you know it just wasn't raining on the unjust? How would you know if you, I, I, my life's just going just fine? Well, okay, but how do you know that He hasn't set your feet in slippery slopes? How would you know it? See, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Them that come unto him must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. So see, this, this thing that faith is essential in, in discerning what mercy is. Abraham's servant, remember we just talked about this recently, saw God's mercy, mercy magnified when he made the connection between the request of his master and how God worked it out at the well. He saw the connection. What happened? Mercy was magnified. He saw. This is God did this. See, but he wouldn't have seen it if he, didn't have, if he hadn't believed in this God. If, he wouldn't have been able to make that, that, that distinction. The seeing of that mercy prompted worship in the serpents. He, he saw it. And he worshiped God. Well, everyone who sees mercy rightly, they'll have that, that same right response. That's what he said. Blessed be the Lord of my master. Why? Because his master sent him on a, on, a, on a journey. He did what he said. He saw how the Lord worked it out. It, 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 well, that didn't happen by accident. God magnified what he did. He saw it. We would say he got it. He did. Now, when you get it, you'll worship God. See, this, this is how it happens. You don't have to have a worship service. I don't know how that, that, that would be possible for us to initiate worship. God does something, and if you can perceive it, you'll worship him, you will. Amen. David said, let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. How can you understand mercy if you're not hoping in God? How, what relevance would it have? What would you do with mercy? If it's not in order that you might prepare yourself for the kingdom that's coming, if, if mercy isn't changing you into the image of his son, if, if it isn't assisting you to be able to make straight paths for your feet, what, then what is mercy for? Is it just so we can keep on sinning and feel good about ourselves? Is that what mercy is? Because I get the feeling that this is what they're being taught out there today. That mercy just covers your sin and you go on doing what you want. What is that? That's mercy perceived mercy independent from faith in God. It has nothing to do with worshiping God. Nothing to do with serving God. It's just like a band-aid. See, not everybody can properly discern the mercy of God. And, 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 and they can. They can if they, if they walk by faith, if they, if they love Him with all their heart. God will open up His mercy. He'll magnify it. He'll do it. You remember the account in Scripture where Cain and Abel, they both offered a sacrifice to the Lord. Abel 
Abel's sacrifice was accepted because he was righteous. That's what it says. And the Lord said to Cain, now, I, I, I want to say this because I, now these, this is the first example. The first two men that we read about that were born in this fallen race. And one's righteous, one's not righteous. One sacrifice was accepted by the Lord, one wasn't. God's teaching us something here right from the beginning. There's some people I will not accept. I don't accept them. So anything they do, I don't accept because it came from them. All right, that's what he said. So he's, but see, the, the, so does the Lord just back away from, the, from that person and say, they're damned, I'll have nothing to do with them. Look at this. God's merciful. That's what he says. Genesis 4, 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? What's he doing? He's magnifying his mercy. He's showing him this. I, I'm the kind of God that if you'll desire to do the right thing, just you do it, desire it. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. There's not any way that I'm going to forgive you if you have a bad heart. It can't happen. Humble and a, and a contrite spirit. See, this, is, this is touches the Lord. The Lord's inclined to people who are less way. Cain was not this way. Why did the Lord appear to him and, and say these things to him? He made it evident to Cain that he wasn't this kind of person. He, the mercy that was, that, that, that was extended in this conversation was not received. Right after this, he goes out and kills his brother, doesn't he? Here we see God's mercy being magnified. It's clear by God himself. Nobody could have come and talked to Cain any better than God did. Nobody. God comes and he says exactly what, what needs to be said. If Cain could be turned, he would have turned right then. That there was a merciful Lord. He, 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 how else could you frame these words? God's merciful. You do well. I'll accept you. I will. What else can you say to men? God himself speaking with Cain before he kills his brother, before he actually did something that were, he, couldn't, he couldn't come back. Not from this. He ignored God. Well, even when mercy and grace are magnified, those without faith cannot make the right conclusions. They can't do it. They can't. See, men can find themselves in a position where God won't hear them anymore. Well, this is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is a fearful thing. And see, that when we talk about God's mercy, God always talks about mercy in the context of His justice, of His righteousness. Why? Because that's the context where it lives. Hebrews captures the real heart of what happened that day. It says, By faith Abel offered unto God more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. The Abel, Abel, he loved God. You, you know that because he was righteous. He did it for the Lord. He did it with a right heart. Well, God testifying of his gifts. God testified of his gifts. We want God to testify of our gifts. And by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Now John adds this perspective in 1 John 3, 12. Not as Cain. Not as Cain. Not as Cain. I don't ever want to be compared with Cain. Who was of that wicked one? Oh, and are we getting to the heart of the matter? Yeah. Are we getting to the heart? What was, what was driving Cain? No, it wasn't God. Right. What was driving Cain? He was a child of the wicked one. Oh, I guess a person could reason, wait a minute, he had the same DNA as Abel? He came from the same mother, the same father. He was a child of the wicked one. Uh -huh. All right, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew him? Why did he do it? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. That's why he did it. So we don't have to theorize about this. God speaks to him. Why does God speak to him? Well, ultimately to condemn him. To damn him. He, he that believeth not is condemned already. And he went to him and he told him these things. He divulged things to Cain that, that, that should have, had there been a heart of repentance, changed him. But it didn't. Because he didn't have faith. His offering was not mingled with faith, and it wasn't received by God. 
So we have two very clear examples. We have Cain, who was given a clear warning by God. You couldn't get any clearer than that. Thereby magnifying his intended mercy. But because there was no faith in Cain, we see he's unable to make the right conclusion. And we have just Lot. All right, now he's been, God magnified his mercy, brought him out of the city, allowed him to go into this town. And yet he has to, before, before, um, there's always a payment, isn't there? You want to walk with the Lord, there's going to be a price tag stuck on that somewhere. You're going to find it. It'll happen. There'll be somewhere, it'll cross your path, that you'll have to make a decision. Am I going to keep following the Lord, or am I going to turn aside? Uh -huh. And believe me, when his wife, who was behind him, turned into a pillar of salt because she looked back, yeah. there, there was a price tag on that. It cost him something. Everyone who wants to, who wants to walk with the Lord, this is the way it is now. If God was inclined to magnify his mercy unto Lot, that he was hear his prayer and bring him into this place alive. You see how this, this, this changed Lot. Lot was not the same. Now you say, well, Lot was righteous. I don't say mean he wasn't righteous anymore. But see, he saw more of God than he had ever seen before. Even when Abraham saved him. See, you see how that, could, that mercy could be veiled somewhat. You say, well, Abraham did it. But see, he knew. Oh, Lot knew. You've magnified your mercy unto me. In closing, I want to say a few things briefly about, um, see, ultimately, the greatest example of God magnifying his mercy is the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, you can't get any more, in a great, any greater definition of what magnified mercy means than when you look at the person of Christ. He's, he's the ultimate person that we hold up and say, look, you want to know about God's mercy? Look at him. We've been subjected in our day to a lot of false doctrine that for the most part has veiled the mercy of God. It's taken the mercy of God and corrupted it somewhat with our own ideas about it. Men talk about mercy like it's totally disconnected from the God of mercy. Like you could have mercy independent from knowing God. It can't happen. They speak about mercy as though it was something that is not bound by the whole person of God. In other words, you can't, you can't just know a little bit about God and stand over here and say, well, I know about his mercy, but I don't, that justice stuff, I don't want nothing. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't how it's revealed. You come close in full assurance of faith, you draw near with a true heart, and he'll, he'll show you, he'll magnify his mercy to you. In other, in other words, in the day we're living in, men are holding out a God who can be merciful to those who prefer sin. Is that, even, is that possible? See, I don't believe it's possible. I don't believe it's possible that a person or a group of people can actually really deep down in their heart prefer sin and God still shower mercy upon them. God's, God has never done anything independent or disconnected from who he is, ever. And so, if God did this, it would be dis disconnected from who He is. He would have to disconnect from being just or righteous or holy. And He would have to deny Christ because isn't Christ the one that bore the sins of the world? The ones that He turned, as it were, His face from? The one, the, the one that He cursed when He hung on a tree? Wouldn't He have to turn his, Himself away from this one that gave His life to take away sin if He was going to impute even one person that had sin? See, Jesus is our perfect example. The death or sacrifice of Christ was successful in removing the obstacle of sin from the presence of God. And that doesn't, because I've had actually people tell me, God doesn't see sin the same anymore. See, when Christ died, what, they re what he really did is he, he God now, he, he, he can handle sin. Really. Really. The death or sacrifice of Christ was successful in removing sin from the presence of God. There is no sin in Christ. And unless you're in Christ, oh, yeah. it, it's the only place where you can be sinless is in Christ. Amen. So see, technically, it's the only place where mercy can be magnified. Amen. Outside of Christ, all you're going to hear is the shout of salvation that you can be pure. You can receive redemption. You can. Oh, it's just a message of hope for now. 
But see, the, the message of hope isn't for you to stay outside. It's for you to come near. See, if we want to see the greatness or the greatest demonstration of God's mercy being mag magnified, we're really going to have to look at Jesus on the cross. Now here you, you've got this demonstration. God's going to demonstrate, for God so loved the world that he gave. Jesus now is hanging on the cross. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. He says, what does he say? Does he say, condemn them all? No, he says, Father, forgive them. Yeah. They don't know what they're doing. God magnified mercy. Jesus, open up. You want to know how you think about sinners? They don't know what they're doing. They don't have any idea what they're doing. Why? Because they're, they don't know God. See, they're, they're, they're out on their own. They're, they don't know what's going on. Well, there's coming a time when, see, everyone who's outside of Christ, even though they partake in to some degree of God's mercy by living in this world where God's showering His mercy, they're going to be totally removed. They're going to be cast into the lake of fire where there is no mercy at all forever. Yeah. Now God's magnified it so that men, if they'll just see him, if they'll just see that Christ did do this, he took away their sins, then they can come to him, see, because God's a merciful God. Well, how sinful is sin? We need to look no further than Christ on the cross. What did God do to Christ when he laid the sin of the world on him? Well, we all know. I mean, he, he, he died. Christ had to die because of sin. So you can't, you know, uh, could God tolerate sin on his beloved son now? It's on his beloved son. His son's hanging there. This was the one he loves. This is the one that always did the things that, that, that God wanted. He laid sin on him. Could God tolerate him? No, he could not. He turned, as it were, his face from him. Why? In order that he might make you the righteousness of God in Christ. He's building something here. He's showing something here. He's revealing something here. Now, the, you could go through... And I did, but I won't, we don't have time to bring them up. 35 different miracles of Jesus. And every single one of them have an aspect of magnified mercy. Every single one of them show a different slant about how God desires to help you. Now, whether or not it was the maze to take up your bed and walk. Well, that man didn't know he could walk. He laid there for all those years. He magnified his mercy. Take it up. The moment the word came out, the man could take it up. What happened? His mercy had been magnified. Every one of them, you see a slant of God being merciful. Why? Because God is a merciful God. The, the problem isn't that God's not merciful. It's that we can't perceive it. See, I'm talking through natural means now. But see, as you get close to God, you'll start seeing things. You'll look back on your life, and you'll see areas after area after area, time after time, where God's magnified His mercy. He's opened it up. And now you can look back and you can testify, He was merciful to me. Even when I didn't understand it, I didn't see it rightly, but I wanted to, He helped me. For He, God magnified His mercy in the clearest possible way. As Christ was being made the payment for sins. And yet, without faith, men can look straight faced at the cross of Christ and turn away. Why? Because they don't see what's really going on. All things were made by him and for him, yet he was cut off in order that we might be grafted in. God's mercy was magnified. Now, all the examples given in the scriptures actually are for those who believe. See, you look into the scriptures and, and you have a great desire to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and, and in favor with men and with God. And, but it's only as you press in and press towards the mark that these things, they become lucid and you're able to handle them and say, you know what? God is a merciful God. I can see it now. What, what's happened? He's magnified mercy. And so Jesus being our ultimate example... This is John 17, 4. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work. See, Jesus lived 
and performed everything that God wanted him to do to where he could go now to the right hand of the Father and he could send his spirit down here and the spirit could open up these things that Jesus did while he was here on the earth. And we could, we could, oh, that's why, that's why he did it. The apostles, the day of Pentecost, they said, this is that. It makes perfect sense. We'll lay down our life for this Christ. Why? They saw it. They saw it. It was lucid in their mind. They could put it together. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit says the day, da, the day star dawns. It arises. See, I used to see men as trees walking, but not anymore. Not anymore. I, you know, those times, they weren't very pleasant either. But see, now that when, when you're lucid in Christ and you can understand, and the mind of Christ is, is, is ministering to you, you can... You can run through a troop and jump over. <laughs> You're ready. I'm ready now. I can do it. Well, I'll leave you with that, brethren. God was magnifying His mercy in a distinct and perceptible way in order that those who believe will be saved. And that's, um, I love the Lord. He's good.